Well, as everyone stated, it is a good evening, so we're delighted to have you here. My name is Raleigh Schendel, and uh, I'm kind of kicking this thing off on your Friday evening. So we want to remind you of a few things before we get started. Um, goose chase. Uh, continue to participate in Goose Chase. Apparently, that's going to end tomorrow, um, according to my notes here. So you have an opportunity to accumulate more points and win a printer. Uh, Chromebook, um, uh, small version of the Eiffel Tower, other interesting things. I don't know if that one's on there. Um, also, what you need to note is that there are a lot more uh, learning opportunities in this TLD conference than you may, um, you may um, be privy to. Uh, please go to the poster sessions. You can find the posters link and then find that under agenda and go there and check out all those posters. There are some amazing posters there of which I pulled three already that we're gonna use in my social studies uh, methods course. So um, with that being said, please be sure to go back. Uh, you can access every single session from this week um, by going back to the video recordings and making sense of them on your own time. So that's a, a quite a beautiful thing. Also, the contact hours form and survey will be given to you at the end of the week. And apparently, this is the end of the week. So I'm assuming that's going to be um, this evening. Please be sure to answer the polling question if you have any ideas for using the insights from this presentation in your classroom. And be sure to utilize the chat and Q&A options to interact with our speaker. This will be interactive and active. So a few questions to help honor and introduce our keynote speaker. Who is the Right Question Institute's Director of Professional Learning for Education? Sarah Westbrook. What does Sarah believe? What drives her passion? Sarah believes that all students deserve rigorous learning experiences that make them feel curious, challenged, and smart. She also believes that all teachers deserve active, collaborative professional learning experiences that honor their expertise. That's goosebumpy stuff. Where does Sarah teach and support teachers and learners? Harvard, across the US, and around the world. How does Sarah support teachers? Well, Sarah leads RQI's online courses, uh, one of which is teaching students how to ask their own questions, best practices in the question formulation technique offered through the Harvard Graduate School. Not only that, she's also the principal investigator on a Library of Congress grant that with hopes of broadening her impact on the world and focusing specifically on teachers who work with underrepresented students. Final question. True or false? Sarah was a classroom teacher. True. In fact, Sarah was a high school English teacher in Boston area public schools. That experience and her BA in English and MAT in English education allow her to connect with and amplify the innovative work educators do every day. And now prepare yourselves for an active and interactive experience with Sarah Westbrook presenting unlearning good questions to create space for students to ask great questions. Thank you, Raleigh. That was a great introduction and I might have to steal the Q&A format next time. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for making time on your Friday night. Uh, after a long week, but I hopefully a, a really interesting week of learning for you. I've had a chance to watch a lot of the recorded sessions and I'm just totally blown away um, by all the interesting work that people are doing. So thank you to MSU Denver for hosting. Thank you to TPS Western Region for having me and for all your work, you know, not only supporting this presentation, but also supporting our work in an ongoing way for the last several years. Um, so I want to start by saying this is a new session. There's there, those of you who have seen the question formulation technique or the Right Question Institute present before, 
some of it is familiar to you and a lot of it is new and it this this new work is coming out of new learning so i'm hoping to learn from all of you i'm curious to hear from you please do interact with us in either of the chat boxes and i'll rely on raleigh to keep me posted what's going on in <laughs> in there um, so you can access this PowerPoint at this link here, and um, maybe Kyle or Raleigh can put that in the chat box. Um, all of the materials that I'm gonna show you today, on, and actually everything that the Right Question Institute offers educators is offered for free, and they're um, under Creative Commons license, which means that you don't need to ask for permission. If you see something that you like, take it and run with it. You don't need to come back to us for permission. So if you're not familiar with the Right Question Institute, I want to tell you a little story about it that I think is really important for understanding the work that we do. So the Right Question Institute, it's a small nonprofit based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it didn't start as an educational nonprofit. In fact, it started when Dan Rothstein and Luz Santana, the two co-founders, were doing work with a group of parents in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And these were parents who were um, involved with Dan and Luz because their children were at risk of dropping out. So this is a dropout prevention program setting. And one of the things that Dan and Luz heard over and over and over from parents was that they're not participating at the school They're because we don't even know what questions to ask. So parents had named a fundamental obstacle to participation, and that's um, the need to ask questions as a way of being involved in participation and decision making. So the initial response was that Dan and Luce gave parents lists of questions. And what they found was that that was a really good way to build dependency. Because every time a parent was facing a new situation or someone didn't answer the question that they had asked, they came back to Dan and Luce for a new list of questions. And so what they realized is that there was something much, much more important going on here, which is that people didn't need to have a list of questions. They needed to be able to ask their own questions in any setting, in any situation, as a way of self-advocating and as a way of learning. And so really, um, I think the Right Question Institute is sort of a misnomer because I, I, it's a little inside joke, in fact, because the Right Question Institute implies that there's a right question, right? And in fact, I think that what the work with parents in Lawrence revealed is that the only one who can tell you what the right question is, is you. <laughs> the, you can have the best question in the world. You can have the, the most perfectly written, incisive questions on a list ready to go. And that ultimately might not be the question that you need to get the information in a particular setting. So, um, so I, I always chuckle a little bit that there is, the Right Question Institute is an institute that is um, working with people to find the questions that are right for them. So parents had named what became the driving mission of the Right Question Institute. Dan and Luz spent the next 30 years <laughs> working on one deceptively simple skill, and that's teaching people how to ask their own questions. So a lot of you might be familiar with the question formulation technique, and, and if you're not, that's totally fine because we're going to do a little bit, a little quick sample of it today, and you can find a lot more resources about the question formulation technique online at rightquestion.org. Um, but for those of you who know it, uh, you'll see, you'll notice that this is the technique that evolved out of the work with those parents in Lawrence nearly 30 years ago. 
For the last three years, the Rate Question Institute has been um, supported by the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources program. And we've been doing work with teachers around the country to try to figure out how to pair the question formulation technique with primary sources. And we've really spent a lot of time with teachers in their classrooms, virtually most of the time, trying to figure out what works best in a math classroom, in a science language classroom, in a kindergarten classroom. And all of that work has um, gone into a four week free online course that is running right now that you can find out more about. These are some of the lesson snapshots. These are all free resources available online if you're interested to find out more about the work with the QFT and primary source learning. Okay, so I, I am called the session today, unlearning good questions. So I wanna ground us for a minute in what I mean by good questions. Um, and I think that the best way to do that is to have everybody take about 30 seconds right now. And I want you to think about what does good questions mean to you? And you don't have to share this, um, just you know, think about it. If you want, jot down a couple notes somewhere about it. Just what is a good question to you? And you might consider some specific criteria and you might also consider what's not a good question. So I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay. All right, so hopefully you have a few ideas and we're gonna return to this later. I wanna start with a story from my own classroom. Raleigh mentioned I was an English teacher in a few different public high schools in the Boston area. And um, th this is the story that really started my interest in good questions and really thinking about the mythology of good questions. So I was teaching the adventures of Huck Finn, which is a lovely illustration you can see on the side here. Um, this was a 11th grade American literature class. And I had started using the question formulation technique, which we're going to see more about in a minute. And I had my students generating all kinds of questions. And I'm really, I spent quite a lot of time invested in this lesson. I was hoping to see questions perhaps along the lines of this one, something about Huck's characterization, um, to what extent was he an individual, what are some of the other influences that shape his moral compass. And so we, we're, we're questioning and questioning. And the final priority question that students decided on that they wanted to discuss that day in class was this one. How old is Huck Finn? So I was disappointed at <laughs> this. I, I was hoping for something, you know, that got a little more to the characterization. You know, and to me, this is a close-ended question. There's, there's an answer to this. It's an answer that I know because I've spent several years teaching the adventures of Huck Finn, um, and I'm a strong reader. And it turns out though, that for my students, this was not an obvious question at all. And in fact, it launched this really incredible classroom debate about, um, you know, could Huck be a five or six year old? Could he be a 16, 17, 18 year old? I had students in this class who really didn't participate very often, like thumping their book against the desk because they felt so strongly um, for, you know, that he, he must be older than the other person thought. And so it turned into this really amazing class discussion with a lot of textual evidence. And it was sort of an aha moment for me because, 
the students, because it was their question and not mine, got so invested in the learning and the discussion that they ultimately had was just as good as the one that I had planned with my questions about individualism. So, you know, it got me started thinking about good questions don't exist in a vacuum. You know, good questioning depends on a response. It's a call and response in some way. And sometimes the most perfectly worded, sophisticated, complex question is not the right question. And for my students in that moment, the question that was the right question was, how old is Huck Finn? So I'm sharing that just to, um, just to sort of ground this idea of, of good questions and think a little bit about where that comes from. And this is the type of thing that I hear pretty frequently from students in my work now. So if, when I go into a classroom and I ask kids, how do you feel about asking questions? Or why do you think that it's hard for some people to ask questions? Um, this is a typical response. This is from a 12th grade student in Boston. And he said, sometimes when I ask my questions, I'm always like, oh, wait, was that a smart question? Was that a stupid question? Um, and uh, there's always that duality to questioning. Like if there are people in our society that we hold up as excellent questioners, if we think about um, you know, a lawyer who, who gets their client off the hook with one really fabulous question, you know, the flip side of that is that therefore there must be questions that are not good, are not smart. And um, students will talk about this fear of seeming stupid or dumb. And that really becomes an obstacle to asking any question at all. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with this fear of ignorance. This is a fantastic book by Stuart Firestein. And, you know, one of the things that he argues in this book is that as a society, we're terrified of looking like we don't know something. And it's a failed opportunity because it's really important for any type of innovation. He's writing specifically about scientific innovation, but I think that fear of ignorance drives our um, approach and our philosophy about questions as well. So um, the, the idea that I've sort of been wrestling with for the last several years that's been fed by my work with teachers and my work with um, especially the Teaching with Primary Sources project is um, could the idea that there are objectively inherently good questions and therefore bad questions uh, become an obstacle in some students asking any question at all. So I want us to just dig into this a little bit more today. And I've um, identified three different sources. And the first is our own questions using the question formulation technique. The second is what I'm calling questioning in the wild. I, I took the idea of primary sources and have been gathering some artifacts for us to take a look at. And then the last source to look at is student questions. And I pulled some student questions related to primary source lesson plans from our, our project over the last three years. Okay, so let's start with asking some of our own questions. And for this, I'm gonna ask you to use the chat boxes quite a bit. And hopefully I'll be able to see some of what you are putting in there. So the question formulation technique, and I should say this is, those of you who know it well, know exactly what a short um, version we're doing today, but this is just sort of a taste of what this technique is. And you can find out a lot more online or from um, the TPS Western region folks who all know it really well. Um, there are four questions that we always use to kick things off. There are four rules for producing questions, rather. So the first is ask as many questions as you can 
Do not stop to answer, judge, or discuss. Write down every question exactly as stated, or in this case, exactly as it first comes to mind, and change any statements into questions. So just think for a second about those four rules and which one might be the most difficult for you to follow. I will say um, rule number two is often very tricky because you really have to try not to judge yourself as you're trying to articulate a question. All right, so um, in a minute, we're gonna start asking questions and I'll ask you to just, we're gonna try putting them in the chat box. So the rule says, ask as many questions as you can. And I'd like to suggest that maybe just ask a question and wait a, a little bit, see what other people put in, and then ask another question, wait a minute, see what other people put in, and then ask another question. Um, I'm gonna give us a pretty short amount of time to do this. And we're asking questions about this primary source image here. I was inspired by um, Dr. Wei's uh, talk the other day. So um, I'm going to show you a larger version of this in one second. So let's take two minutes. For those two minutes, you're asking questions. You're not judging, especially not judging yourself. You're changing any statements into questions and you're reading what other people are putting in uh, the chat box. All right, so here's the larger version. This is what you're asking questions about. And I gave you a brief caption down at the bottom. And those of you who know this image well, don't feel like you have to play a game of guess what the image is. I, I want you to ask questions from your own perspective and your own experience, whatever that is. Okay, two minutes. So I see what kind of car is in the picture. Why is there a need to announce that you're American? Keep them coming. Who put up Why the sign there... in the center of the storefront? Mm -hmm. Why are there no people? What was Lang's purpose in taking this photo? Where was the picture taken? What is Wantoco? Who are white and pollard? Okay, keep them coming. Why is the car center stage? Is it an American made car? Is the sign permanent? How do you become do you... an American? Hmm. Is there conflict in the city? You have another minute. Keep asking questions. I see what happened to the people who put the sign up. What else besides fruit and vegetables are sold in the store? Who is the intended audience of this photo? What's the difference between who is an American and what is an American? Is the store open for business? Is that a mailbox? What is the purpose of this photograph? What are you arguing? How do they see out of those windows when they drive that car? Is the I am an American sign a defensive act? Was the person trying to make a point? Is there a different view on the other side of the street? Hmm. Do the people who own the store live above it?
All right, try to get in your last question. Let's see. What was the catalyst for putting up the sign? Was the store given to someone else when it was confiscated? What is beyond the edges of this picture? What year is it? Okay, so that was a very quick burst of questioning. Um, and I'm gonna, it, this, is, this is very good though, thank you. I'm gonna move us to the next step of the question formulation technique. And um, for that, you can look at the questions in either chat box. All right, so the next step of the process is thinking about closed and open ended questions, and I know there are a lot of ways that you can categorize questions for our purposes, there are only two there are closed ended questions and those are any questions that can be answered with a yes no or one word answer. And then there are open ended questions and open ended questions are any questions that require more than a one word answer. All right, so now here's where it's gonna get tricky because we have two lists of questions. We have um, the Zoom chat box questions and the Whova <laughs> chat box questions. But um, if everyone, let's see if we can, we'll just focus on the Zoom chat box questions for a second. So um, we're gonna label either C for close-ended or O for open-ended. And I, the way that we're going to do this, theoretically, if it works, is that Kyle's going to launch a poll. So um, for the purposes of that poll, let's label what kind of car is in the picture, which is the first question I can see in the Zoom chat box. So what kind of car is in the picture is the first question. And um, I know, Kyle, can you launch that poll? Yep, it should be live in Hula right now. Okay, so vote and see if you think that question is closed or open-ended. What kind of car is in the picture? And then the second question is, why is there a need to announce that you are American? And let's see whether that is closed or open-ended no kyle or raleigh can you tell me the results of the that poll because i can't see it unfortunately yeah sure so i just got the second poll up and the first poll we've got one uh open and eight closed okay and what about question two those are rolling in okay question two i think we've why is there a need to announce that you are American? So we've got five, six open, one closed. Okay. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. So the interesting thing is with closed and open, you know, the categories seem fairly straightforward, but almost always there are a few questions that seem to defy categorization. <laughs> And you can debate back and forth, you know, why you think a question is closed or why you think a question is open. And that discussion is ultimately much more valuable than whatever label you, you put on it. So sometimes I'll cheat and put like a C slash O, which is totally fine. As long as you state your case, you have the discussion why you think something's open or closed. Okay. Um, I wonder if anyone's willing to say like why there was seemed like there was maybe some some disagreement about question one is anyone willing to say why what car what kind of car is in the picture why did you feel that that was open or why did you feel that that was closed and you can put it in the chat box too Who 
Okay, Linda says, it, if if you answer make and model, it's answered. And Sharon seems to agree. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to move us. And then Kent says there are lots of different labels for cars. Okay, so interesting. Um, you, I think that you could make the case that it's it it might depend if if you're going to use three words or one word. Does that change your mind? Does that change whether it's an open question or a closed question? And so I I ultimately don't have a stake in it. I think we can put C and O for now. All right, so I want us to think quickly about closed and open-ended questions. Um, and you can think about the ones in our list, our collective list, or you could just think about in more generally in your life. So when you think about closed-ended questions, what are the advantages you see to closed-ended questions? And you can just quickly put that in the chat box. Any advantages you see? I see the conversation is over. Maybe that's a good thing. Neat, tidy answers, direct right and wrong. There's usually a right answer or one answer. Quick, more participation by reluctant students. Give quick facts to check for understanding. Okay, what about the disadvantages? So what are the disadvantages you see to close-ended questions? It, the conversation ends quickly, dead end conversation, no room for critical thinking, stops the discussion, they might not invite more questions, no real participation, lead to poor testing techniques. Thank you. All right, I'd like to move us to thinking about the open-ended questions for a second. So open-ended questions, and again, think about your own list or think about just in general, what do you see as the advantages of open-ended questions? You can find out what's really being asked. Students can engage with each other rather than just with the teacher ownership of the thought process, allow for higher order thinking skills, fuller discussions. Okay, thank you. All right, what about the disadvantages? So what do you see as the disadvantages to open-ended questions? Okay, Linda says, I don't see any. Sharon has, students might be afraid to share dumb questions. The questioner may become more confused about a topic. It takes more time to explore and open the inquiry. Can get off topic, going off topic. Yep. Yeah, and who've a reluctance to participate, um, needing the right answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so there are, advantages and disadvantages to both closed and open questions. And they both can be good and right, depending on the, situ the setting and the situation that you're in. Um, okay, so because of that, I'd like to see if we can add, one, if everyone can add one new question. And so I challenge you to take a question from the chat box that is closed and change it into an open-ended question, or take an open-ended question from the chat box and change it into one that is closed. And I challenge you to choose a question that you, you really think could be beneficial, or you think it could be strategic if you asked it in a slightly different way. 
or it might get it some different information if you asked it in a slightly different way. So try not to choose the question you think would be easiest to change. So I'm gonna give everyone one minute right now, try to craft one more question that is based on something that you saw in the chat box. You have about 30 seconds. So whenever you're ready, just put a new question in the chat box. And again, you're trying to change something that is closed into open or take something that's open and close it down. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm seeing a bunch of questions in this in this chat box anyway. Um, why would Lang wanna take this picture with the car in it? Why was the picture taken? Or why did they hang the sign on the storefront? What year is it to what clues do you see in the picture that helps you determine the time period? I see, what does it mean for someone to be an American change to? Did the person, people that put up the sign consider themselves an American? Okay. So um, I'm moving us into what is going to be the last step of our process today. And again, I'm reminding you, this is a very quick QFT. And um, if you want to explore more, you can. So I'd like everybody to choose um, a priority question. So normally, we say choose three priority questions and the, why you chose those questions. I think it's a little tricky with the chat box. So see if you can just choose one. If you, if you wanna choose multiples, that's fine too, but at least have one in your head. Okay. All right. So hopefully everyone has a priority question that they thought of. So I'd like if there's anyone who's willing to share, um, what's your priority question and why did you choose it? And you can also feel free to also explain your rationale in the chat box if you'd rather. But if there's anyone who would like to come off mute and, and say what their priority question is and why. I think my priority question would be, what does it mean for someone to be an American? Did the person or people that put up the sign consider themselves as American? Mm. But the first part, what does it mean for someone to be an American? That's wide open. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Other priority questions? I think it'd be important to ask um, what's the priority or purpose behind the photo being taken? Cause we don't really know um, beyond the photo itself. Like if it was supposed to be a statement of some sort or just maybe an advertisement for the store or the car. So I think as, asking about the priority or purpose behind the photo, we can um, have a bunch of different answers to that. And it'd be interesting to hear the photographer's perspective on that. Mm, thank you. Well, thank you all so much. I, um, I will come back to this 
image, you're going to see it again. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that I chose it is that I think it, it speaks a little bit to some of what um, Professor Wei was talking about on Tuesday night, but it is an image that's taken from the Japanese American internment primary source set at the library. So some of you may have seen it before and you will see it again um, in a few minutes. So I want you to just hold on to that your questions um, and particularly hold on to what you were thinking about with open and close ended questions, because that's the piece that we're going to dig into just a little bit more um, right now. So you'll see that I cut the QFT short. There are more steps. Um, and again, it's just to give you a quick sense of what the technique is, and also to have some questions for us to look at when we get into this um, next piece of discussion. So I told you we we're going to look at three different sources today. And the second one is the one um, that I, I have been collecting. So I've been amassing a questioning collection. Um, and most of these primary sources are sort of everyday items, modern day everyday items, which I think is pretty powerful for students to, to realize that, you know, they're living primary sources. It's not, um, they're not necessarily something that has to be in a library collection. So I want to dig into them and I would like us to look at each item and just share some of what you're thinking in the chat box, but look at, look at the artifact for questions, for how questions are being deployed and for the language of the questions. So don't worry quite so much about what the content of the, the document is, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I think of this as exploring questions in the wild. Um, outside of the classroom, really thinking about how questions function. So I'd ask you to just track anything that surprises you, track which questions are close-ended and which are open-ended, and then keep in mind what is either confirming or challenging your definition of a good question that you wrote down earlier this evening. All right, this is something that I found as part of our work with National Geographic. So we created a course with National Geographic about teaching students to ask geo-inquiry questions. So you don't really need to know what about geo-inquiry questions. What I'd like you to take a look at is the questions being asked. Um, this is a profile of explorer Anrik um, Sala, who is a marine ecologist. And the, the profile is, it, um, trying to explore what are the questions that drove his career, you know, that drove his research. And so the, the first question right at the top here is, is there any healthy ocean left? Is there any healthy ocean left? The Pristine Seas Project, Sala's organization, um, would set out to answer this question. This initial question led to more, what is a healthy ocean? Where are the last wild places in the ocean? What does a complete undamaged marine ecosystem look like? What are the threats? Who controls these pristine waters? And how can those leaders be convinced the waters are worth protecting? So uh, anything, that, anything that surprises you here? And what are you noticing about closed and open-ended questions or the way questions are functioning more generally here? The initial question is a closed one, I see. Thank you. The closed and open questions dance together beautifully. Thank you. But it requires more questions to explore the topic. It seems that each question gets bigger. It says closed and moves to open. It's 
Interesting how a closed question leads to a great deal of open ones. Yeah, yeah, I'm really struck here that, you know, the, the question that started his interest in his career, you know, what, what ended up being his life's work is a closed question, but it's a very provocative one. It's sort of an emotionally resonant one. And I, I think you're all absolutely right that you, you often need a lot of questions, you know, so these profiles of these real life explorers, you know, not one of them is answering one question, you know, they, they all, their research involves a lot of questions and um, sometimes just one doesn't stand alone. Okay, thank you all so much. I'm going to move us to this one's sort of fun. This is uh, Google keeps track of what are the most common questions in search terms, and they release a report every year. So this is one from um, the UK. If you can, the most common questions that were Googled in the UK. So take a quick look at this. And this was 2020, which I think you can tell from the questions. Um, this is actually taken from Lanny, Dr. Lanny Watson's a blog post. She is a UK philosopher and professor who works on questioning. So anything that you're noticing on this slide here? Yep, no question marks all closed factual, Google may just have the answer to everything. <laughs> yep. So one thing that I'm, one thing I notice here is um, there is one question that does not seem like the others. And I wonder if there were a lot of people learning their own Great British Bake Off at home in the middle of the pandemic. Um, yeah, that's that's the one. And I think, you know, a lot of these are closed. Not all of them are, you know, how to make a face mask would require explanation beyond a one word answer if you go by the RQI definition of closed questions. Um, but lots of them, what time is Boris Johnson's speech? How many people have died? Those would get you a one word answer. Okay. And per, yes, and maybe there was a vanilla shortage, Kyle, that could very well be it. Okay, here's one. This is uh, from a couple days ago. I saw this as a, the, my doctor's office sent this to me as a screening questionnaire and I had to steal it because I thought it was such a great example. So um, anything that strikes you here, like is there anything you would add to our list of advantages and disadvantages? of closed and open-ended questions. A bit confusing language needs if yes explain <laughs> yep um yes mary i bet that's true so this serves as an effective screen to bring up more questions yeah i i think often um you know close ended question it's some of this your doctor really needs to know yes or no. Um, so perhaps it's effective, although yes, you might want some additional explanation. But I think that what, what something I think a lot about is just the volume. When you're, when you're an institution that is dealing with hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, then um, it's something that you might also need to understand who, it, who are your patients, um, what is your audience. And so often when you're thinking about, you know, survey design or evaluation, or you, you often to look at qu big quantitative pieces of information, you might need close-ended questions. 
So that's um, so another consideration here. Um, Keith says, it seems like these sorts of questions have some level of shame attached to them that might lead to people not being honest. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Okay. Um, so we also have a census. Um, this is pulled from the 2020 census. And so as you imagine, the census has an awful lot of close-ended questions on, on that. This though is pulled from the explanation of the census. So the US Census Bureau put out this big document explaining the questions that are on it. So I want you to take a look at the questions that are in the boxes here. And this is the way that they have laid out their privacy principles. So do we need to collect information on this question? Are our efforts reasonable? Do we treat people with respect? So what the ones that are in boxes, would you say those are closed or open-ended? Yeah. So I was, this, this absolutely fascinated me that, um, you know, why would you state your principles as close ended? And Rachel, absolutely, they have an open explanation. So um, the, anyway, I, I'm totally fascinated by this document. And I think, I wonder if they're stated as closed because you, to, to almost set up, set themselves up for the best possible answer. You know, so they're the types of things you don't want. You don't want the question to be, to what extent are our efforts reasonable? Because maybe you don't like that answer. Um, so I, I wondered about that, but I don't know why they are phrased as questions. So think about that one. This is something I would, I'm gonna send you to do on your own time when you need a chuckle, but this is a journalist interviewing a British politician who really doesn't wanna answer a question. Um, and so he's using a lot of close ended questions to try to pin him down. So um, this was something I, I imagine that John McLean probably <laughs> can relate to in his time as a uh, journalist. Okay, so the, the last thing I want us to look at tonight is student questions, which is what um, the Right Question Institute is really all about, is uh, the student questions. And one reason I really liked looking at the questions, looking at documents that have questions in them from our real world um, and our modern day sort of lived experience, is that I think sometimes that can be really effective way to get students thinking about questions beyond the classroom too. So uh, there are a lot of teachers that we've worked with who've pulled things like the school admissions documents for students to go through and take a look at how questions are used there. Um, and so that can be a really interesting exercise with students to do too, and just get them to really think about the language of questions. So I'm showing just a few examples of questions today. There are so many more, and I, I would point you to the lesson snapshots um, at writequestion.org. But this is a 11th grade English classroom. This is a classroom in Kentucky. And students were um, reading the crucible, and they took a quick look at a primary source related to the Salem witch trials. This is... Um, the, a page of a book written by Cotton Mather, who was um, sort of controversial figure, in, instrumental in um, really some of the terrible outcomes for uh, the witch trials. So I'm showing you this, there's a full list of questions here. The questions in bold are the questions that the students chose as their priority questions. Um, and I, I put ones in boxes here because one of the things that the teacher found with these, this set of questions is that, you know, the, the questions were 
didn't really get at what she was hoping for to some extent, which is that she wanted students to make the connection to the text they were reading, The Crucible. And instead, they had a lot of questions, um, some, some about Cotton Mather and the Salem Witch Trials, but a lot about the, um, the actual writing and the style of the document. And one of the things I like to point out here is that, you know, these are the types of questions that weren't were not ex she was not expecting, but they led to this really amazing discussion about the language choice in the primary source document, the text, um, why that might have fed into some of his messaging in this document, and so they, these were unexpected questions, but they were questions that really um, opened up an unexpectedly rich discussion too. So this is an example from a seventh grade classroom. And I saw that there was a question in the Whova uh, Q&A about virtual learning questioning. So I just wanted to share this one because this was done completely asynchronously over a week on Padlet. And um, so these were seventh grade students. And I think you'll recognize the document that they were asking questions about. <laughs> that it's the I am an American image again, that they had a slightly longer caption that's taken from the bibliographic record page. And what do seventh graders want to know about this image? So um, why is the car there? Who is the owner of the car? Is that a BMW or, no, or something? Um, and I, I want you to take a quick look down at 16 and 17. So this, what happened to the Japanese Americans and did they ever get full-fledged justice? So a few things here, and I, I invite you, if there are questions that stand out to you, go ahead and drop the numbers of them in the, the uh, chat box. But the questions that I just really resonate with me are, um, you know, did they ever get full-fledged justice? You know, that's phrased as a yes, no question, right? Did they ever get full-fledged justice? Yes or no. Um, and and yeah, it's another one where I feel like the question itself is so, so packs such an emotional punch. And that's something that closed-ended questions can do sometimes. Um, and, and Raleigh's noting question 10, yeah. Yeah, and this was a classroom in California too. This was a classroom in Southern California. Um, and I'd also say, you know, that this was another instance where the teacher was really a little bit concerned about some of the, the directions that the first three questions were going. Um, the, you know, is it a BMW or something? And I will say there were even more questions about the car on Padlet than I included here. And, um, you know, the questions about the car are kind of fascinating if you really dig into that. You know, why did Dorothea Lang frame the car right at the center? I think someone asked that question earlier when we were coming up with questions. So um, it's, it's, you know, is there something about the car and American progress? Is there something about the car and the lack of movement that Japanese Americans don't have? The, the car as a symbol of freedom? I don't know. I mean, I think that could have been a fascinating discussion on its own to dig into. So um, I, th I think, whoops, that means that we're coming up on time. But I think that one of my takeaways from the questions that kids ask is that, you know, not every question on the list is necessarily tightly related to the lesson objective. You know, not every question is um, you know going is uh, is expected right, and that's okay. But sometimes these questions, if you can be a little bit flexible, they actually get you further than you were going to go with the perfect question. Um, and you know that that's what's really great about hearing student questions in the first place is that they can shed new light on something that you've taught a million times before.
Um, I'm going to show you one more. And this is this is what the full Padlet looked like when it was done. If you're interested in any virtual learning resources, we do have those um, at rightquestion.org. I think either Kyle or Raleigh could put that in the chat. Um, I just I want to show you this one just because it's a, a STEM teacher who's using a um, Ptolemaic model of the universe with his class. Okay, I'm showing you one more list of questions here. So these are the student questions. Um, and again, if there's anything that really stands out to you, go ahead and put that in the chat now. And I just, I'm gonna flip back and forth here because I think sometimes it helps to remember the primary source they were looking at. So one of one of the things that I always um, am, am totally struck by is the, yeah, Michelle, like you're, you're saying the God and his disciples, the question about the church, the angels, um, are they praying the circles behind their heads? And if you really look at the image, you know, there's a lot of this religious iconography in here. Um, you can see the two, it looks like, you know, maybe the wind spirits or something are at the bottom blowing. That's that question about why are they blowing? And so I think there, there is a discussion to be had about, um, the the religious iconography and how that shaped scientific models and ideas and then um i think like michelle saying it could be a clue to help students place when this is from when and where this artifact is from so it was again an example you know the the objective was about scientific modeling are the questions exactly about scientific modeling no but they, they could, if you lean into the strengths of what the questions are, it, it's possible that it would bring you back to scientific models and questioning scientific models, which was the objective. So um, I've, I've given you a few different things to look at. We've asked questions ourselves. Um, we've looked at some medical forms, the Census Bureau, some primary sources. And we've also looked at the questions that students are asking. So I'd like to close just by asking you to take a look back at what you said initially or what you were thinking about initially about good questions. And has anything shifted for you? Um, what are you thinking about now about good questions? If you could share that in the chat box, that would be great. So any reflections at, about good questions or anything that's really stuck with you? And Raleigh, if you could read me from the other chat box, but I see um, good questions often lead to more questions, inspire other questions, drive inquiry, nurture dissonance, challenge perspectives. Good questions come from students themselves. Good questions often end up with cross-disciplinary research still feels like a good question fosters debate. The open-ended question from a kiddo is the best kind. I think I'll try to incorporate both open and closed questions in class discussions so that students don't wanna look stupid can answer the closed. Questions matter because kids ask them. It doesn't matter what kind of questions, but ownership does. Thank you, Kent. Leads to additional inquiry. I totally get that students could be afraid of sounding Stupid that happened to me in this discussion. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> you know, I think it, it is a real barrier to participation. Um, and I think, 
you know, and I think that if we freed ourselves a little bit, you know, if we freed ourselves a little bit from good, like good questions, um, and we thought, you know, if we, if we sort of excise some of this from our vocabulary and pushed ourselves to expand into something like, you know, what, what's going to be the most strategic question for me or what, or did I get the information I want um, in this particular context? You know, if we could train kids to just get rid, move away from thinking of how can I be a good questioner and move away, move towards how can I be a strategic questioner? I actually think we would get a lot further. Um, so I, I hope that you, I hope you take this message, if nothing else, you know, questioning is a little bit, gets a little dirty. Like you have to get your hands dirty. You have to see what the kids ask. Sometimes they ask things that are just amazingly profound. Sometimes they ask things that you don't think are profound, but actually are if you let them talk it out a little bit. And so, um, you know, I, I think if we could just take some of the pressure off of ourselves to be searching for something that sounded good or sounded smart, um, that that would be a huge step forward in getting kids feeling comfortable being curious. Raleigh, did I miss anything in your chat box? I'm sorry to be prioritizing the Zoom chat box. No, you got it pretty well. I, I was cut and pasting some of those over there when you didn't uh, see them, so you're good. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, th thank you all so much. Um, I, ha I would be remiss if I didn't end with this slide, which is a Right Question Institute favorite. And this is just a, to leave you with the idea that questions are really important right now, perhaps now more than ever. And um, it's because, you know, questioning, going back to the story of the parents in Lawrence, questioning is not just a learning skill, it's a self-advocacy and a participation skill. And so this is a famous educator, Septima Clark, who probably should be more famous than she is. She was um, fired for, from her position with South Carolina schools because of her involvement in the civil rights movement. And one of the things that she said is we need to be taught to study rather than to believe and to inquire rather than to affirm. And so that's, that's really why we're doing the work is we believe that in, in teaching questioning, in exploring the work of questions, whatever those questions are, you're equipping students not only for lifelong learning, but also for better, more effective, more strategic advocacy and participation in decision making at every level of democracy. So um, I will pause there. I know that uh, Raleigh and Kyle have some final reflection to do with you all. And I'll just say, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the work that you did in producing questions and in looking at the various things um, that I brought in today. Sarah, it was uh, uh, a divine pleasure. And just to see the, the wide variety of sources and resources that you uh, weave together in a learning experience is a reminder to me personally of, um, you know, I get, I get so excited about primary sources, but secondary and complementary and pop culture sources and a quote here and a little tidbit here just helps, you know, build the the whole ball of goo that a kid just wants to stick their hands in and see what's hidden in there. So I, uh, I'm delighted by all that. And I appreciate your inspiration to us all and uh, the many um, ideas and for, um, you know, taking us on this archaeological dig, so to speak, and saying, you know, pick up a tool over there. There's more under, under this ground that we're standing on, uh, more of which includes um, four-week online training, um, from the Right Question Institute and just um, helping yourself uh, gain the tools and the thinking that'll open more space for learner growth. So it's bringing tears to my eyes. I appreciate that. I, um, um, I'm, I'm not quite dehydrated yet. I haven't cried enough today. So I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Raleigh. Yeah, we'll never look at a survey again the same way again. I think <laughs> we're all, we're all, the next survey you take, you're going to be really picking it apart. Yeah, yeah, that'll be great. So just leave space at the bottom to give your doctor some feedback on the, <laughs> the types of questioning they're using. Uh, so as a group, you know, and Sarah, you're welcome to participate in this as well. What we thought was I had this amazing conversation with Sarah to think about, okay, how, how might we kind of um, celebrate and honor this entire week and the opportunity here that Sarah's created for us to um, question everything. So just question everything uh, in the sense of uh, becoming a better teacher, becoming a better person, becoming someone who's more thoughtful, you know, life um, requires that. So this is certainly a golden opportunity. Um, what Kyle and I thought we might do is take a, a stroll down memory lane, so to speak, and um, use Padlet because, you know, we've, uh, we've honored Padlet here through Sarah's teaching. And if you were experiencing Laura and Michelle's teaching on the Padlet, many Padlet uses um, during the week, then you have greater insight of how to use Padlet. And maybe you're just a Padlet guru already. Um, whatever the case, we're going to dig into Padlet. So we're going to have Kyle share with you an example of what we want you to do to remind yourselves of this week, to grab hold of things that you find dear, that moved you, that inspire you as a teacher, and to use questioning to lead to more questions, to drive your inquiry, to grow as a teacher, to, to shake it up for yourself, to make you think differently or challenge your thinking about teaching and learning and to um, grow further. So in, in essence of honoring Sarah's teaching and our practice of creating questions, uh, we have a sample here on Padlet. So you're checking out this sample. You're also going to Padlet yourselves and, you know, free. You just click on it and start a new one. I think you get three free. Um, here's an example of the first day of this week driven by questions. So uh, you can also you can click on your screen and zoom this out and make it bigger so you can read it. But the first one is, why is the Library of Congress like salt to a bread baker? So that's my question that kind of synthesizes what's new to the LOC that Kyle and Keith shared with us. We also had some veterans history project um, learning experience on Monday. And my question is, how might I create my own primary sources for learning? Hmm. Another experience that day, where do propaganda advertisements, important events and rich primary source discussions collide? Historical newspaper session. Will you tell me a story? Presidents and first ladies session. And then leading into the next day, which is, have I been missing out on TPS Teachers Network? So we want you to do right now for about five minutes, we'll just time it, we'll sit here and look at the chat. You can holler at us, uh, give us questions in the chat, we can problem solve and brainstorm with you. So we're challenging you to jump into Padlet and just practice, uh, capture your questions uh, throughout the week. You don't have to use timeline, you can use um, any of the other ones, the shelf, the canvas, um, whichever one works for you, and just kind of start to capture your questions um, from the week. You can also do that on a piece of paper, you can do it on a blank screen on your computer, or you can just start capturing those questions with links to like where you got the question, possibly in the chat. Kyle, anything to add? can't find my unmute button. No, I think, you know, it, uh, the idea I think of questioning is that it really helps instill some of that learning um, that we've done throughout the day. It helps us uh, think about um, these facts, think about thoughts and ideas and abstract ideas in different ways. Um, 
and it's good to mess with questions like we did with Sarah, I think, you know, and change, change the way we ask questions so that they can be answered in different ways. Um, yeah, just lots of, lots of questions. So keep going. You've got about four minutes to just be capturing all your questions, messing with the Padlet, or just sketching a web on your paper. Um, I'm not going to talk the whole time, but I do want to maybe remind you that fusing uh, this process and your Padlet, you know, as a as a, a venue for holding student thinking and capturing that um, with the question formulation technique is absolutely brilliant um you know mess with it change the rules uh omit one of the steps you know switch the steps around start with step five um you know go crazy with it that's that's really your job is to mess with students you know and uh, mess with the learning processes and build um you know purposeful and strategic thinkers And Raleigh, you put it in the chat there that where's the unmute button? You know, I think that's important with the judging part that I should have just put that on there. Feel free to unmute and shout out a question. Maybe you just, you feel like you're like, oh my gosh, I just came up with a, an interesting question or is this question messed up or does it even make sense? Um, those questions have uh, profound value as well. Kyle and I had a conversation today and he's like, well, here I have, and he started to tell me something. He's like, no, it was a, it's a not really a developed thought. And I'm like, I totally want to hear it now. That's, those are the best ones. So just any of your thinking, uh, if you want to shout out and, um, you know, share a bit. A question from Chad, as all of you capture and write, um, how can I use student-driven questions in my next formal DBQ? How did I forget all these fantastic resources I learned the last time I was here? Rachel, that, that, that's the question um, that I was waiting to hear because essentially um, what we're doing right now is intended to be uh, a profound practice that helps you hold white knuckled to something you want to take away. So, you know, if in the least you go back to your classroom, you go back to your library, you go back to your teaching and learning environment and you use one thing. Once you use that one thing, your goal might be, OK, 
okay, I'm going to use a second thing or a third thing or whatever, but don't hold back, reach out to us and get a reminder of what you learned um, or save your timeline and go back to this Padlet and go, oh my gosh, I've got to go back to that um, session and use this strategy. Going to the other chat, sorry to uh, fade away from that a bit. So uh, there were people talking about uh, using, you know, the anonymity of Padlet to have students help sort questions, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, hmm, interesting from Mary. Um, how about what questions matter and why when we think about good versus bad questions? It's very interesting. Yeah, bring that this conversation up with your students and have them define the thinking. They're, they're sure to have greater insight than we are because they haven't been schooled as long. So just about another 30 seconds so you can capture your thinking and take some artifact away um, that can help you remember, recall, and recycle, reuse, and reapply in your classrooms. So we are going to come back together. Uh, thank you for honoring that process. If you did, um, if you did not, time's not over. I mean, you can always finish the conference and sit down and decide, okay, I'm going to give this Padlet idea a try and or maybe it just leads to some powerful teaching and learning experience that you're going to use in your classroom with your students uh, or your library with your students on Monday. So Kyle, we have a few business items to deal with, like giveaway. Yeah. Um, so before I guess I say thank you, Crystal, do you want to mention who the giveaway winner is for tonight's uh, book pack? Um, sure. Um, the winner for tonight's gift pack is going to be Emily Ruley. I think I said her last name right. Um, I will shoot you an email um, to get all the information I need from you. So congratulations. And other than that, um, you know, click the rate session so we know how we did uh, during this TLD and during this session in particular um, to give us the feedback. Um, for the contact hours request, we'll send out a survey uh, here tomorrow or the next day here. It'll come soon, I promise. Um, and that'll contain uh, the contact hours request inside of the survey. So fill that out and um, when we send it. Um, and other than that, you know, thank you just so much to everybody for attending. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions. Um, and even more so, thank you to the TPS team, um, Sherry, Cindy, Laura, Michelle, Raleigh. You're just phenomenal, um, have helped out so much and we couldn't do this real without you. So um, thanks everybody to joining and anybody else with last words, anybody um, in the audience too, feel free to unmute. Hop in, we're waiting to see people in goose chase and we've still got people answering questions. I know Laura's gonna bring that up, but thank you for all the sharing that you've done in the community boards of Whova um, as well. Um, we've been in there, you guys have given us great ideas. We're still answering questions on our question doc. Um, keep joining in and we're gonna be around and we'll keep monitoring and 
um, responding. Who was going to be up for a while? So is Gooch Chase. And so we look forward to when we all have time to digest these fantastic ideas, I'm um, continuing to share. So thanks, Kyle and Michelle, Keith and all are, of you. Are we going to cut the Goose Chase off tonight at midnight? It's off tonight at midnight, but you've got until 1159. And we got people in there moving. So um, yeah. that are hot to trot. There are some high point questions, yep. especially that have been added lately. So you've got time. Yeah, and thinking about the not just goose chase. So we had four goose chase games. We got five um, grand prizes. So we're going to be uh, giving away to the top leaderboard, the top three in the leaderboard, and in Hoova as well. So we'll cut that off at midnight um, as well. And just as a reminder, um, once again, thanks everybody, especially the, the the team here at Metro, Kyle and Crystal and Peggy, all of our master teachers. That Kyle mentioned uh, Michelle, Laura, Raleigh, Sherry, Cindy, everyone else. Uh, really appreciate all the help. Um, this gets to be a bit of a, a long week as we early mornings and late nights, and so we really appreciate all the work, um, especially since um, I'm coming off of COVID this week, and so they had to really step up and, and fill in some gaps for me personally. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, thanks. Um, to Sarah again tonight for, for, for leading our keynote and kind of finishing off the week. And thanks Raleigh for kind of uh, capping the whole thing together. We always ask you to do that. Um, and just as a final note, um, if you hadn't figured it out yet, everything we've done this week has been recorded and is up on Whova, so the learning does not have to stop when we're done today. Um, our contest will end, but the content's gonna be up, up for at least another month and you can, we're gonna honor PD contact hours up until the end of March. And so if you didn't get all your hours in, like we'll, we'll um, give up to 15 hours. So if you didn't get all 15 hours and now, um, we'll give you a little lead way to get that done and, and we'll send out that information on how to, to fill out that survey and get that information. So that's kind of key. Don't feel like we have to stop now or if there's something that you, you missed, don't feel like you missed it because you didn't. Um, this will be up um, probably tomorrow morning. I'll probably get up early tomorrow and edit this and, and post it. So um, for anybody who missed this one, not that they would know because they're not here. So. Um, but other than that, that's all I have to say. And I'd like to thank everybody again. Um, final word, Raleigh. Um, it was a pleasure to help uh, Sarah kind of wrap up the journey this week and inspire continued learning through all of our uh, question generating. So thank you so much, Sarah. It was delightful to meet you. And I appreciate all of you in the audience and those of you attending all the sessions and asking such incredible questions and uh, making me feel um, like I'm part of something beautiful and amazing. So thank you.